time it is four o'clock. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Thursday, July 9th. And if Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit would please join us. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have 15 items for your consideration. Great. Let's Want me get to started. go ahead and start? Yes, please. First item ARA 21418 vocabulary.com. This contract modification will provide for continued access of vocabulary.com, a vocabulary development tool that is a critical factor for student success and a strong predictor of literacy achievement across disciplines for grades 6 through 12 students and the Office of English Language Arts. Approval is requested to extend the contract for an additional two years and three months and increase contract spending authority by $516,000 uh, over the term, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $846,000 with one vendor approved by the board in April 2018. Great, good afternoon, Michelle. Good afternoon. Thank you. And I had a few questions on this contract. Sure. Um, was this originally competitively bid when it was approved? No, I believe 18? the original contract approval was under 6002. That's correct. OK, great. And the notes we received said that it was piloted in the 1718 year. Should that have been this yes. year? So we or was the pilot across? the current school year as well as last school year since it Great was improved questions. in April of 18. <clears throat> Great question. So both are true. So in 2017-18, we piloted in nine middle schools. Mm -hmm. And then in the 18-19 school year, we expanded to all middle schools and then added three Lighthouse High Schools as well as Catonsville High School. Um, so both are true. We just extended that pilot. And then now we're looking um, to seek approval to be able to expand it to all high schools and continue with all middle schools. Great, and you may have answered this in curriculum committee, so I apologize if it's no problem. duplicate, but can you summarize for this committee the results of that sure. pilot yep. and your findings? So we had um, over 400 teachers using it. We had um, 21,000 active students. They answered a total of over 10 million questions, mastering 374,000. And so what we mean by mastered, part of the um, design of this particular program is based on research around word learning, where students have to encounter a word in multiple context as part of relationship, so they learn it in context, they learn it as analogies, synonyms, antonyms, um, and the feedback from the students was they were very engaged and interested in it because it um, challenges them, but they can also uh, create their own list, so they can create lists based on what they're trying to study for or, pre or prepare for across all of their content. So this one license allows the students and every teacher across the disciplines. Um, so the teachers gave us really positive feedback feedback that they liked the ability that they could actually um, search. They had a searchable database of primary source documents, so some of our government documents, um, as well as different textbooks or novels. But they could also um, cut and paste any piece of text that they were preparing to teach their students. And it would identify the academic vocabulary and create customized lists. Um, so we got really positive feedback, um, both from a quantitative standpoint in terms of the words mastered, but then also qualitatively um, from our teachers. In fact, the reason Catonsville High School was added was because they had created a PLC um, across disciplines to focus on literacy across the content areas, and this tool allowed them to truly and authentically collaborate in that way. So I imagine you had quantitative and qualitative goals for the pilot before it was introduced. How did, did your results compare with those original goals? So part of the quantitative piece was we were looking to see that it improved word learning on a very specific data. O over time, we would hope that would also transfer to some of our high stakes assessments, but we know that that's a goal in terms of all the other factors that come into place. Um, the qualitative goals that we were seeking were twofold. One was, as I mentioned, this need for a customized tool 
um, where students, it would um, respond to how students had res um, responded in terms of um, continuing to feed you words that you had not yet mastered. Um, and so that goal was met because of the number of words that we've mastered and we saw growth over time as well in terms of the number of words students encountered but then the growth in the number of words mastered. The other qualitative piece that we were seeking was this cross collaboration that I mentioned. We were looking for one tool um, because sometimes when we seek different tools for different content areas is that's necessary to have that specialized support, but we try to remember that it's one student going to all those different classes, and so part of that qualitative goal was to have a uniform tool, if you will, that we can use um, in multiple content areas. Thank you very much. Sure. It's a fun tool. I've used it with my daughter. It is right? fun, yes. <laughs> You'll have to join a word jam one time. Revisiting it to, <laughs> when reviewing this contract award. Sure. It's a great tool. Great. Board members, Thank you. do you have any other questions for Ms. Shea? No? Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay, the next item, JBO 70218, maintenance, repair, operating supplies, industrial supplies, and related products and services. Uh, this is a consent to the assignment of this contract from Supply Works to the Home Depot Pro. There are two other award bidders on the original contract approved by the board uh, in August 2017, and uh, this is necessary as the result of a corporate merger and the Home Depot Pro is the Home Depot <laughs> as you know it across the country. The orange big box store, the Home yes. Depot. Thank you. Board members, questions? Ms. Rowe? So what types of things is this contract purchasing? So I have a list here that will prove fascinating. Um, bearings, linear technologies, power transmissions, motors, hydraulics, pneumatics, gearing, conveyor systems, industrial rubber, fluid power, and any related products and services. Um, let's see. Also, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> rubber fabrication, vulcanizing, hose fabrication, hydraulic system components. Um, so, okay. uh, well, I was just going to add in CT. HVAC, and HVAC is included in there. What is that what most of those for? Yes. HVAC system? Yes. Okay. We've added 26 schools since this contract was originally developed with air conditioning. Well, I'm content to maintain those systems. <laughs> okay. I was just going to add for CTE, we buy hammers <laughs> and nails and <laughs> things for our CTE students as well. Any other questions? No, I, no? Will, I will just say it's was originally confusing that we were combining the purchase of curriculum for, for CTE, sure. seeing that it was a purchase for um, CTE as well as facilities. But yes, they only use the CTE. To why it was combined into one award, that's all. But yeah, I think they use less than 20% of, of the total the purchasing, purchasing of power. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the next item uh, MWE 80216, plumbing supplies and equipment. Uh, this is also a contract modification uh, to provide continued purchase of plumbing supplies and equipment for the Department of Facilities Management and the Office of Career and Technology Education and Fine Arts. Uh, this is both a consent to the assignment of this contract from Supply Works to the Home Depot Pro as well as request to uh, approve increased spending authority of $217,800 to bring total uh, contract spending authority to $1,533,800 with seven vendors approved by the board in November 2015. Okay. Board members, any questions? Hearing none. Okay. The next item, MWE 802-19, English Learner Database. 
This is a new competitively bid contract for a database for English learner students. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with the option for a five-year extension with one recommended award bidder and contract spending authority of $2.4 million from both operating and grant funds. Great. Good afternoon, Dr. Rista. Good afternoon. So I understand this, how this product meets our requirements for Title III paperwork, and then it's a database for tracking those requirements. It looks like it provides some automation around that and makes it easier in terms of efficiency. What wasn't immediately clear, and maybe you can clarify for us, is if this provides any content or curriculum in terms of um, English learner support and, and what features, maybe you could provide us an overview of the product itself and what features are offered. Sure, sure. Um, so you are correct that it has the requirements similar to what we have for our special education students. This will communicate with our student information system and it will be able to provide the general ed teacher as well as the ESOL teacher information about levels of students um, and then the specific letters and things that are required would go home with it. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as other, uh, there's no curricular materials on it, but there are um, pieces of it where the content teacher can take uh, the levels and information, it would guide them towards like strategies and things like that that they can use. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's not curriculum specific. Okay, those features on the website look like they're coming soon if you look at their, their marketing Perfect. around the product mm -hmm. itself. So I was curious to see what features of it we're exactly purchasing. So it sounds as if right. the and reporting and the communication tools. Right, and there's options. Um, so there's like a basic platform which is what we'll initially be purchasing, and then there are options for um, other features, as you're saying, if they meet our needs or not. But we know that they, it can communicate with our student information system, and the immediate need is getting the general ed teacher information about the levels of the students who are English learners, and then making sure that those correct forms are going home um, to families and things like that. So will the integration with our student information system be included? Are we all in with this spending authority of 2.4 million? Will that include the integration with our student information system? Yes. Out of the gate, so at go live it will be integrated? Yes, we, I mean, uh, the, there's been discussion back and forth with the vendor and our um, DOIT mm -hmm. as far as the capability of it happening. Okay, so they advertise a six to eight week integration period with, as they say, all student information systems. Is that mm -hmm. realistic and is that what we expect I, I to realize to. in terms of turnaround once we? Yeah, I, I would have to check with DOIT, but it's my understanding it'll be ready for the start of school. Okay, so in terms of additional, I'm seeing some nods from staff in the back, yeah. maybe. That's part of what we've worked through. Okay, yes, Jim is saying yes. <laughs> okay. All in integration support, trying to understand what the 2.4 million includes in terms of product support and integration because that is a significant cost when we are talking about integrating products. Right, that, that's the cost for five years and the extension of five years. Sure. Okay. And did we consider a pilot of this since this is all in and, and a new purchase in terms of rolling this out to all of mm -hmm. our schools? Was a pilot considered? We did not consider a pilot of it, no. Okay, what was the, the rationale, if, if you could speak so, to that? So this is information, um, this is the information that our student information system does not hold in regards to the levels of the, of the students. Um, so as far as it's not curriculum for them to use, so Right, I understand what it okay. captures. How are we currently meeting um, these requirements? It's, How are we tracking that information? Paper? It's done by paper right now, yes. Okay, including the letters and in those languages. Those are being translated, I assume, by Through the other vendors that, yep. Other vendors, so this mm -hmm. is replacing those translation services, or would be replacing? 
Well, need also, for that the tool? a piece of what is in the system is like an accommodations document. So, therefore, the ESOL teacher would be previously filling things out in paper and handing them to the general education teacher about what the accommodations would be, and this would be an electronic way for that to happen. So that's also a part of it that would not need to be translated. Um, the certain required letters by MSDE, yes, that already is um, translated within the system. Okay. So we would not need to retranslate using our outside vendor, if that's what the question is. So if, if you could help the board understand the need for this now is what I'm trying to get at is well, yes. I, I understand we want to move from paper based processes mm -hmm. and efficiency is a good thing and the more we can take off of our teachers is a very good thing. But if you could help us understand the urgency of this purchase and there are many needs throughout the system, what I'd like to understand is why this is a priority and sure well we um, I would say it's because of our increasing uh, growth of students who are English learners in our schools and a majority of them spend most of their day in general education classrooms so it is more of a support to the general education teacher because they're aware of student levels and again they can pull information about what their accommodations are and what the expectations are for it. So although we have centers, um, there are a lot of students who have waived services but it still would be good information for that general education teacher to know what their levels are based on their WIDA scores and things like that. So it, it's streamlining. Um, information about students so that the teacher can be better prepared for their planning um, and again because we are now up to 8,000 students who are English learners and growing uh, about a thousand every year we, we feel that this is a priority sure it's a population that's growing that we're trying to serve are there other districts that we've um, looked at who are using this product that we have have based our decision around. To I can see check with the group, but I believe yes, it's already used in other Maryland districts. Great, Frederick and Mar any other Maryland districts There's using it that you know? Thank you. Ms. Hen, I'd just like to also add, when we talk about why now, in addition to our rapidly growing ESOL population, as you're well aware, our data acknowledges that our ESOL population is our highest dropout population. And so anything and everything we can do to elevate the quality of instruction for them and the supports that they get, not just from ESOL teachers, but from our general classroom teachers, uh, will put energy and effort towards changing that data in the right direction for our students. So that's part of why uh, it's not merely just the efficiency for adults to go from paper to digital, but also the urgency around moving achievement for our ESOL students. Sure. Thank you. And will this meet, is this in alignment with the feedback we've received from our gen, general teachers and ESOL teachers as something that they need in order to better serve these students? Can you speak to that? We were given positive feedback from all all different all different offices and sections that this was really important so that we can make sure that we're sharing the information with the content teachers. As Melissa said, the content teachers are working with the students most of the day, but as the current system doesn't really allow for us to share information very easily, and so this will make sure that they get real-time information, including their accommodations, which they are, are supposed to receive, so we can make sure that we're more, um, we're in compliance with all of the uh, paperwork, but also the law. Thank you. And of course, it's important to be in compliance, I, and it's a sizable investment. I just want to ensure that we're prioritizing according to what our teachers are telling us that our students need most important. So thank you for answering those questions, everyone. Board members, other questions? Ms. Rowe? 
So can you tell me on this contract, um, the 2.4 million, how much of that is to get the system integrated with our system and how much is going to be a reoccurring expense every year? So it's a per pupil um, cost to it. Mm -hmm. the, the integration part is not where the cost is, it's the number of students every year that we would be entering in it. There's like a flat rate for the platform mm -hmm. and then there's a per pupil rate every year. So are they not charging us to bridge it with our system? We, we, do, we do that work. Yeah. Oh, we're doing that ourselves, okay. Um, my other question is how many languages does this support? So this is not a translation system. This is giving the information from our English learners, their level of, um, so the students after they take an exam are uh, rated with their level of proficiency, how much English they're speaking. So it shares that information mm -hmm. as well as the accommodations that are required for the general ed teacher to give to the students. But it has letters that go home in different languages? S if there are things that need to go home, it would translate the standard letter that Maryland State Department of Education requires us to send home. Mm -hmm. it, it translates that in multiple languages for the families so as how, a part of it. How many languages does that support? It's over 50 languages, and it's all of our top 10, including Burmese, which is often a very difficult um, language to get um, translation into. So it's really important. Okay, and how many languages do we have in the school system? So there's about 40 some odd languages that are not supported. How are we going, what's our, are we going to keep doing paper for those languages? How are we doing that? So currently we don't have um, translations in 97 languages, that's unheard of. So what we, okay. <laughs> it has to be on the record here, and that's why you use my phone. Oh, okay. So, um, so what we do is, it's working. Um, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we don't have, currently we don't have translations in all 97 languages, so our obligation is to ensure that parents understand it. So it will go home with a letter that says if you need help with this in some of our more um, discrete languages that have, we have maybe one or two students who speak that language. Um, and then if needed, we make a phone call home using language line to make sure that the parents understand that letter. But right now we probably have the letter um, Maryland translates that letter, mm -hmm. um, and they only translate it into about 30 languages. So with Elevation, we will actually have it translated in more languages. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, board members? No. So I have one other question, Dr. Wistead. So you mentioned <coughs> that we're currently using paper processes. Mm -hmm. So the impact of, should the board not approve this contract award, the impact would be we would continue using those paper processes That's for correct. the upcoming year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next, next item, one. JBO 72719, Supportive and Nurturing Learning Environments. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for behavioral consultants for the Office of School Climate. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended agency and contract spending authority of $1.5 million uh, with the University of Maryland Center for School Mental Health. Board members, questions? Ms. Rowe? So are these board certified behavioral analysts? What are the profession, what, what services will they be providing for us? Sure, so I'm sitting here because it's a grant funded um, contract that we're working through and it's through our Title IV grant, which I'm the grant manager of. And there's a section within the grant that um, follows for safe and healthy child. So what we'd like to do with the partnership with the University of Maryland is contract out these behavioral consultants are not board certified behavior analysts. Mostly they're social workers and they will be working with us with our initiatives in training for restorative practices, conscious discipline, youth mental health first aid, and others. Um, as required by the T 
Title IV grant. So um, these would not be people that are going directly to schools. They'll be working to uh, support our professional learning that's happening, as well as uh, collaborate to be able to train people to be trainers so that then we can sustain the professional learning over time um, when the grant exits us. Okay, so professional development, that's pretty much and how... And collaboration um, with schools in the planning for the professional learning, yes. How many hours or... They'd be full-time. How many, I guess cumulatively, like how many hours of professional development are they giving us? Is it five people at 40 hours a week or... So they... There's some data down there. Right, so... So we're looking at, for this cost, getting 2 or 2.5 people through the University of Maryland to collaborate the professional learning. So they may be people that are um, delivering professional learning, but more of their role is the coaching and collaborating um, with the professional learning and the school staff. So they... um, They'd be working full time through the University of Maryland. We would contract out their services to work with us in these larger initiatives. That's like seven hundred thousand dollars per person. So this grant is five years. Oh, long. Sorry, I missed that part. So the first year is two point six FTEs, and in the remaining years of the grant, there are three FTEs in each For year. Five years. Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any other questions? So, Dr. Wistow, when you say they'll be working with us, um, who exactly? Can you define that further? We'll, sure. And which school-based staff will they be working with? So, um, the staff comes from University of Maryland, and they would be collaborating with our central office staff in the Office of School School Climate, as well as school-based staff in any professional learning that they would be organizing. Um, They've done things in the past with us where uh, we've had groups of principals, teachers, instructional assistants, things like that, that after professional learning, they'll provide coaching sessions for it. Um, They've organized and collaborated. They have um, spent time specifically at a school that maybe is building up an initiative, and maybe they'll spend several weeks at one school working through things and then pulling back so that we can sustain it without them, and then come back for check-ins and things like that. Great. Thank you. Okay, the next item, MBU 53619, Title I Services for Neglected and Delinquent Institutions. This is a new Cooperative Administration of Programs contract to provide neglected and delinquent institutions within Baltimore County, as defined by Title I, with mandated funds required by the Maryland State Department of Education under Title I Part A guidelines. Approval is requested for a four years, 11 months agreement with four recommended institutions and contract spending authority of $1 million. questions. Ms. Rao? So when you say institutions, Mm -hmm. what exactly do you mean by that? So as a requirement of the Title I grant, we need to set aside a certain amount of money for students that are in these institutions, um, and, and we give a per pupil allocation to the institutions based on how many students are there. So the specific, um, institutions that we'll be working with are the Board of Child Care, Catholic Charities, um, Shepherd Pratt, and Children's Home. So basically there are students that are BCPS students who are in these institutions and were required by law to give a portion of the Title I funding to these institutions for the students based on how many are there. So these are like private placements and the I um, guess I'm just, how does a student end up in an institution? Do they not get educated by BCPS? So 
Um, so some of the students may be going to school there, but some of the students may be living there and going to school elsewhere. Um, this isn't about anything Baltimore County has placed. This is not a special education, non-public placement. This is um, where the students live mm -hmm. and we're required by law to give a per pupil allocation out of the Title I funds to the institutions for students that are there that are Baltimore County students. Okay. Okay, thank you. Next item. Okay, next item, MBU 523-19, Suicide Prevention, Intervention, and Postvention. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide evidence-based suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention training sessions for the Office of School Climate and grades pre-K to 12 students, staff, families, and community members. Approval is requested for a two-year contract with the option for three one-year extensions with three recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $120,000. Good afternoon, Dr. Good Curtis. Good afternoon. Board members, questions? Ms. Rowe? So I noticed in here that you have, it says um, training sessions for students. Um, is there some portion of this that's going to be preparing our students for maybe they have a friend who's at risk and they determine this? Can you? Um, Explain yes, what uh, that would look like. Yes, a portion of the curriculum, it's not a curriculum, but a portion of the educational activities that are provided to students are what they can do to uh, acknowledge when they or a friend has uh, a serious uh, threat of harm to self or to others. Mm -hmm. And then to support their students by collaborating with them, consulting them, and then um, reaching out to a trusted adult. So what does it advise a student to do who encounters a friend who is either hurting themselves, talking about whatever the criteria might be? What are we telling our students to do? As I mentioned um, earlier, it's uh, based, one key component of the SOS training is a piece on, um, that uses the acronym ACT and ACT says uh, the message is acknowledge that you are seeing signs of depression or suicide in a friend and that it is serious. The C stands for care, show your friend that you care, and then T, tell a trusted adult. So you would either, you yourself would go to a, and tell a trusted adult or have that student go to tell a trusted adult. Great. Okay. Other questions? Okay, thank you. thank you. The next item, JBO 72119, medical evaluations for BCPS absence management programs. This is a new competitively bid contract for workability evaluations for the Department of Human Resources Operations. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with two recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $500,000. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. So this replaces an existing contract for medical evaluation. So are there any significant differences in terms of the services that are being procured? This is somewhat of an expansion because it adds an additional company okay. that can provide for us um, additional locations throughout Baltimore County. Um, we actually are adding 188 potential providers but it also adds specialists that we don't currently have. Um, we have a group with occupational medicine, but we at times find the need for a specialist for neurology, orthopedics, rheumatology, cardiology. Okay, thank you. Board members, other questions? Ms. Rowe? So, are these, their medical professionals, are they consulting on whether or not a person can return to work? Is that what this is? 
So in our absence management programs, we provide several services, one of which is to make sure, A, that we are appropriately paying benefits, mm -hmm. but we also are looking at their return to work status, um, their ability to perform the essential functions of a position, um, you know, again, whether or not they are appropriately out or there is other supportive treatment or, or resources that we can provide to an employee. Okay, so I noticed that the companies are in California and Texas. So how does that work? Uh, like because you're not going to send an employee to California or Texas, so I need to understand. Actually, those are both are national companies, so they both have offices in Maryland, okay. and we um, will work with them. The one MCN has a company has holds the federal contract in DC as well, so they also have a Maryland. So they're branch. everywhere. So they're everywhere. Got it. Okay. Other questions? No. Okay, awesome. Thank next you. item is ARA 200-20 Automated Vehicle Location System. This is a new cooperative contract agreement for an automated vehicle location or AVL system for the Office of Transportation. Approval is requested for a one-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $294,000. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. So this is for the contract for the software, is that correct? For the AVL equipment? That's correct. For yes. the location. Okay. And this is for the same software that we've previously? That's correct. It's an extension of the current an contract. An extension of the current contract. Yes. Great. Thank you. Is there a reason we've just contracted for one year at a time? Is that how we the county are, has um, been? We're, we were, it's Perfect. cooperative with Baltimore County government, and after their initial term, they typically do one-year extensions. So we we follow, we align ourselves with that process. Gotcha. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Does it apply to the buses, the vehicles that employees drive, all of the above? Yes. So currently, the, this software. Um, and the hardware is on all buses. That includes BCPS buses and contractor buses. And we are now in the installation process for all white fleet. That's all I had. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. The next item, MBU 53319. Tire recapping, this is a new competitively bid contract for tire recapping for the Office of Transportation. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with two recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $750,000. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So in this, we have two recommended bidders. One is in Frederick and one is in Baltimore. Yes, ma'am. So that's correct? Okay. Um, great. Oh, I apologize. My name is Clayton Freeze. I'm a fleet technician supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Nice Good to afternoon. meet you. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here with us. Any board members' questions? Mr. McMillian? Is this going to save us money by uh, recapping tires rather than purchasing new tires? Yes, sir. Approximately, uh, recap tires approximately half the cost of a new tire, and it has the same longevity and guarantees as a new tire would have. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? The risk of sounding ignorant. What exactly is recapping a tire? Okay, not a problem, simple question. Um, a tire consists of, two, consists of two parts. You have what's called the casing, which uh, in layman's terms would be the side of your tire. So on larger applications like trucks and buses, when a tire tread wears down, just like on your car, the casing is still in good shape, the sidewalls, the things like that. So that we take a used tire, send it to a factory, well, they'll actually mill off the remaining used tread and adhere a new tire tread onto the old casing. So you're basically buying half of a new tire, but the casing, and one of the good things about using our uh, retreading companies is they warranty the casing. So if we send them a used tire for recapping, they do inspections on it, make sure it's safe to operate, and they warranty it for the life of the tire. So instead of buying a brand new entire new tire, we're basically just buying a, a tread that is adhered to a used tire. Are there any considerations about um, 
how do I say this? Do they have the same safety ratings as new tires, and are, are there any safety risks doing this method versus getting a new tire? Absolutely none. The tire company warranties their tires, and we have certain uh, levels of repairs that we allow a tire company to make before we would reject the tire. So they guarantee that tire for 10 years once it's once they install it. So as they do their inspections at the tire factory, if they find a reject, they will return the casing to us and say, we refuse to retread this product because we don't think it, it's safe to operate. So okay. it is absolutely safe. We've been doing it for decades. And do we have a cycle of inspecting them regularly? Yes, we I do. Assume. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. I'm curious. How much does a new tire cost for a bus? Well, we have three tires that we currently have. And to give you an example, 11R225 uh, tire, which is a larger tire that we have on a significant number of buses, a new tire is $328.32. That's priced as of today. A recap tire is $145. So it's a substantial savings, and you're still getting a good quality tire. The tread that's actually going on the tires is from the manufacturer. So let's say, example, we have a Goodyear tire, and uh, we will put a Goodyear tread back on it. So it's the same chemistry in the retread tire that would be on a new tire. And are the front tires any different than the back tires? Are they all the same? We do not retread any of our steer tires. That's actually against the law. On the only retreaded tires will be on our traction tires or our rear tires. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, have a great day. You too. Okay, the next item is MBU 534-19, promotional items. This is a new competitively bid contract for promotional items for all BCPS schools and offices. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with six recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $500,000. Questions, board members? Okay. Hearing none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you're going to do the next yeah. one? Good afternoon. Uh, item 12 is KSH 317 17. This is a, for a contract that was approved by the board on 7th of February in 2017, and this is a consent to the assignment for one of the vendors. There were three vendors, S.C. Stevenson, Ruling, Whitney Bailey Cox, and McNanny. S.C. Stevenson Consultings has been changed to CTI. So this request is to approve the change in the company. And just for the benefit of the board members, <clears throat> the purpose of the contract is for testing of materials during construction. It is an independent testing of soil or concrete that is required in the technical documents that we prepare. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. And just to clarify, it's they were formerly CTI and it's now SC Stevenson. That's correct. Am I understanding correct. correctly? I think I misspoke. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next item is CWA 118-19 oh. and is for disposal services for science, chemicals, and chemical waste. This contract will provide licensed technician to provide for disposal of science chemicals and chemical waste. Our environmental office identifies what type of chemical it is, and the vendor is going to follow all the federal and state regulation for disposal of those chemicals. Great. And what types of chemicals are we talking about? The disposal of here? Could you a lot give us some of these examples? chemicals are science lab related chemicals. So it could be totally different. It could be mercury. Uh, it could be asbestos. It could be you know a lot of other things. Okay. So each each chemical has different set of requirements and different set of documentation that is needed. Okay. The um, I had one other question on this. The annual expenditures to date average right around one hundred thousand. That's correct. And the spending authority that's being requested. Um, for five years is 800000 So I was curious as to the increase, if there was a reason, if we expect our um, 
expenditures to increase for the next five years and what the rationale behind the increased spending authority request would be yeah, if there the, is one. Yeah, so the, uh, the most recent full year of, let's see, expenditures, 2018 was $100,000, but the year prior um, was uh, $150,000. Um, and we've already spent 65,000 year to date. So we think that we're going to be trending well above the hundred thousand uh, dollar a year um, average. So we built that into our projection at about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. We took the, the highest, most recent year. Okay, thank you. Board members, then, other questions? The next item is CWA 112-19, and that's for environmental remediation, restoration, and repair services for all schools and offices. The typical services include cleaning, disinfecting, or insta installation of ceiling, pipes, carpeting, grids, and other associated grid work. Typical examples include uh, mold in several sh schools, and this contract is used for the, for cleaning and disinfecting of those situations. Okay. Thank you. Questions, Ms. Rao. So I understand the need to clean mold and these different things, but um, are our costs associated with this going up? And can you explain or speak to what we're doing to ameliorate the problems so that? they're not recurring because last summer we had several schools that the whole wings of the school, every surface, every room, everything broke out into mold and obviously that's expensive to clean and laptop cases and everything and I guess my concern is we can pay a whole lot of money for cleaning these things which when it happens I understand we need to but what are we doing to make sure that these things aren't happening? It's, it's a very good question. Let me go first behind the reasoning for why it happens. As you know that we have air conditioned number of buildings in the last couple of years. Uh, we have put more than 40,000 students in air conditioned environment in the last three or four years. As we air condition old buildings, which were really not designed for air conditioning, and we mix cold air with the humid air that we experience here in this part of the country, we are prone to creating humid situation. If the building is designed initially for air conditioning, then the insulation requirements and a lot of other design requirements to prevent moisture from entering the building is totally different than an old building and try to air condition that. So some of the problem that we have experienced is because of historically high humid conditions, added to that newly installed air conditioned system in old buildings. What we are doing, if you recall, board approved an insulation contract not too long ago, and in last uh, several months, we have added insulation to a lot of piping that did not have insulation because it wasn't required that much at that time. Uh, we have looked at all possible source of infiltration of uh, humid air to, in the building, and we are trying to patch it as much as we can. The final part is the operation of the building itself. If the building is not air conditioned and we leave the door or window open, there is no condensation. But if the building is air conditioned and we leave the doors and windows open, we are getting all that moisture air being mixed with the air conditioned air. So we are working on changing the operation of building. We are looking at the insulation of piping, and we are increasing our communication with the school-based personnel to see that more caution is needed. And the only other thing I want to add to that, Ms. Rowe, uh, last summer was the wettest summer in Maryland history. Yeah. 
we got more rain in July and August than this state has ever had. So okay. I would assume that that had a significant impact on it because we had our, some of our neighboring counties experience some of the same stuff in trying to address the amount of moisture that we had in the area as it relates to what Mr. Dixon is saying about those other three factors coupled with the amount of rain and moisture that we had just, I think we hit the perfect storm of it. So we're hoping that this summer won't be as, as impactful as it was last summer. So activity in my garden suggests this summer is going to be just as bad. But um, are we doing anything as far as running dehumidifiers in classrooms or places that we think have that obviously if mold is broken out in a specific school or specific place before we have some idea where this might happen are we trying to run dehumidifiers to mitigate the risk we did that in uh, several schools last year and uh, it helped but the humidity is just so much there that typical uh, dehumidifiers that are available are of limited help so the best source is to improve the operation to insulate the piping and to patch any holes that might be there uh, for humid air to infiltrate in the building. And, and we have done extensive amount of work. And, uh, so when you're using dehumidifiers, <clears throat> are you using like the kind you would buy in our house or are you using like the gigantic ones that insurance companies use? We use whatever our electrical circuits allow us to use. I see. Yes. Our, so that's the problem yeah, sometimes? That's right. that's okay. Right. Mr. McMillian. Several months ago, we talked about the mold issue on buses. And I see the first bullet item talks about all schools and offices. Would this cover the buses too? If there's a need for this, I don't, I don't see why it cannot be used for that. It is for remediation at any place. So if it is needed in buses, we can use the contract. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you. Or that brings us to our last. So, yeah, award. the last item is from the uh, Division of Research Accountability and Assessment, KSH 322 19, Consulting Services for Boundary and Capacity Relief. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide consulting services for boundary and capacity relief for the Office of Strategic Planning. Approval is requested for a four years, 11 months contract with four recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $750,000. Terrific. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me fill up. So I just had one question on this. Do we have the actual um, expenditures both to date and yearly and on the current contract? Uh, let me check. For the, we currently for the contract. rely on one of these four vendors. We have proper um, we have crop. GSI services. Right. Yeah, I do not. Do we know what the lifetime and year-to-date expenditures are? No. I will uh, be able to provide that information later on. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rowe? So I noticed one of the things, one of the items is population analysis and forecasting. And I'm gonna use Pleasant Plains as an example because I assume if we're gonna do a boundary study on Pleasant Plains, it's a good example. Is that the school system's enrollment numbers for Pleasant Plains shows that Pleasant Plains current unofficial capacity is at its 2024 projection with because of the December 30th numbers that gets used every year it's wrong and so what I'm wondering is what I've noticed with boundary studies is that they have a tendency to use the enrollment data that we use for funding formulas and everything else because those become the official numbers of the school system but I'm concerned that as we're doing these population analysis and forecasting, we have a number of schools with transient populations whose students enroll after September 30th, and this happens every year, which means the numbers are wrong every year. And I think that it's important for boundary studies that we use real numbers like in December or January numbers as opposed to the uh, funding counts that are the September 30th counts and I wanted to know if this is what 
this contract, will this allow for this to happen? Excellent question. Thank you so much for asking that. One of the conversations that we had with SAGE was taking a look at after September 30th, where, where do we see areas within which there are some fluctuations in terms of enrollment counts? We picked the September 30th count because that provides a consistent mark across all studies. Because if we were to look at September 30th for one school, December for another, it makes it inconsistent in terms of the processes. We have had conversations with SAGE in terms of asking where are there are irregularities, where do we see over time in which we see adjustments. The benefit of using September 30th is that over the course of the year, in November, in December, maybe in January, when you know some of the rental markets provide incentives and, and families move, you may see a bump in enrollment. But over time, you see those numbers really kind of regulate and they're consistent. So that particular number helps us in terms of having a good baseline of where we are. But we do, as part of the process, provide um, the committee members with additional information as, as, as it's requested. Okay, so for Pleasant Plains, are you going to start with the number of 704 when you start their boundary study? We will use the number that's listed as of September 30th for last school year. I don't have that that's number. That's like 680 something. So basically, we're gonna do a boundary study that's gonna leave a school, an entire classroom overcrowded because next year, it's not gonna go down to 680, and the September 30th number next year isn't gonna be 704. So what I wanna know is, where's that extra classroom full of kids supposed to go when we're done with the boundary study? And I think that's part of a decision that the committee will make. What we do is provide the numbers. We create a variety of scenarios. The committee is part of the process. We give them all of the information that they're requesting, and the committee will make a decision in terms of which group of students would be moved to a different school. Okay, so I've watched these boundary study Ms. processes if, happen. Ms. Rowe, yeah. um, in the interest of time, we need to stay on on track with the contract award before okay. us. I have one and more if I may suggest that the bond boundary study discussion be taken offline. I'm okay. Sure. Dr. Um, Phillip would be happy to discuss it with you. My other question the is these are these companies are all um, are they sage subsidiaries? They are not. Okay, so they're these companies are assisting the central office or sage? What's the interaction between there are three specific items, and so for this particular contract, there are almost three specific purposes. So the companies that bid, um, we had a team of six. Um, we had a total of, I think it's about seven that we had. And so they all provide um, a different service to the school system, but they're not connected with SAGE. For example, for item one, we have um, one particular company. Can I say the name of it? We have one particular company supplied um, geographics um, for, um, then we also have CityGate, Cropper, MGT of American Counseling, and Synergy. So they're all separate companies that provide a specific service. Okay. So the population analysis and forecasting is which company? Population analysis is CityGate. And MGT. And MGT. Right. Okay. Mr. McMillian? I have one question. Is each boundary study, the cost of each boundary study, specific or unique to that particular situation? Yes. So would a, would a high school boundary or middle school boundary study be more expensive than an elementary study because it's dealing with a larger population, larger area? Yes, that's correct. And what's a ballpark cost on something like that? At the elementary level, we spend approximately $60,000 per study. Um, at the high school level, the number would vary because we're looking at more schools, more students, and we're looking at population areas that are a little bit more dense, so it's a little bit more complicated. But if we're looking at 64 in elementary, I would estimate that it would be more than that for a secondary study. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All set? Thank you very much. Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Saris, you mentioned that there are four, four companies here that have been selected, but that one has been doing most of the work? 
Uh, Cropper has been, I would say, doing most of the work uh, historically. And so by designing this RFP to provide specialties in the conducting of meetings and data analysis and GIS systems, we've broadened the, the ability and the resources that we have to bring to bear as these boundary uh, studies become more and more complicated. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before we wrap up, gentlemen, I did have one return to item M4, I believe it was. I had an additional question for Dr. Wistead on MWE 802.19, if we may briefly. <clears throat> on the English Learner Database. Thank you, Dr. Wistead. Sorry to call you back up. No problem. Um, would you happen to know the percentage of funding between the operating budget and grants of the 2.4 billion spending authority? Mm. What portion of that is grant funded? I was going to say it's about half. Yes. Yes. 50-50. Thank you. <laughs> and of the grant funded portion, is that restricted to, and could you describe how that is restricted? Um, sure. No, there's Title III funding, and it's not restricted to using only this. Uh, the Title III funds can be used for a variety of different things. Thank you. And my last question is, this was a competitive procurement process. Um, it, I understand that elevation was selected based on it being the lowest responsive, responsible bidder offering the most favorable proposal. That's a mouthful. Um, so it was not simply the lowest priced proposal, but also the most favorable, I'm assuming, in terms of functionality. But could you speak to why it was selected in terms of other? Well, I'll call Dr. Sullivan problem. up since she was part of the committee. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I know that it begins with uh, we list uh, criteria and then the different companies bring their information and, and how they align to that. And so she can give a little more detail about what, exactly what happened. Thank so you. Good we, evening. we looked at four different products. Elevation is the only product that is designed specifically for English learners. So all of the functionality is specific to our work. Um, and so that made it just so much, um, so much of a better product. Um, also, in, they have a much larger staff, and so a lot of the other products, they were going to be building things for us, mm -hmm. and this was already a program that has been designed and built and is used across the country already, so it has been um, proven to be effective. In really limiting the amount of time that our teachers would be taking to do this paperwork will really extend the amount of time that they can give service to the students. Great. And they do advertise an instruction and curriculum piece of it, and I want to ensure that we're not receiving, we're not using, or being priced for something that we're not using. Is that that there's was worded very badly, but yeah, yeah, I think you understand so what I'm saying. Melissa explained there's two features. There's the database and then the strategies. And so half of the cost is the database, and then the other half is the strategies portion. The strategies really is taking the information about each individual student and their proficiency level across the areas, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and then saying, based on this child, this is a good strategy that you can use for the content teacher, for the science teacher, for the social studies teacher. So that's the second portion, but there's nothing specific to our curriculum. It's just here are some uh, instructional strategies to use. Okay, so when they advertise the curriculum, which we're not purchasing, we're not buying something that we're not going to be Correct. using. No. It is priced based on what we're using. We're not over purchasing. No. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kuhn? I had a question. You said that we're going to pay out of um, grants and operating funds 50-50. Is the expectation that 
I'm just curious how mechanically that works. Do we spend all the grant money first, and then we start using our operating budget, or how do we do it? So for um, the cost for per student is $25 for both products, $12.50 for the platform and $12.50 for strategies. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can't use Title III funding for the platform because that is all the compliance pieces, and so we as a district have to use our own operating funds. So we'll be using operating funds for that purchase, but in order to get the entire pro um, product with the strategies, we're able to then use Title III funds um, because that's more of an instructional aid, um, and so that's something that MSD would approve us to use Title III for those funds. So it would be, we'd be paying 50% for the platform using operational and 50% for the strategies using Title III. So, that so the invoice will be broken down and we'll have two separate accounting lines for the respective components or services. Okay, and we, we already have the grant money lined up. Yes. And, and the operating money has been a line item. It was approved by the board, not even the last school year, I feel like the year before. Okay, all right, thank you. And then, just so I'm clear, you, you, you called the strategies learning aids. So the strategies are, um, so the, it's not curriculum, so I was just That's trying to really explain how that works. Yeah, it's not it's curriculum. So it's like, so if a student is a level one listener, what can the teacher do to make sure they're imparting the content in a better way? And so it would give you suggestions on how you could do that directly to the teacher. It's nothing student facing, it's to the teacher. And it allows the ESOL teacher to also shoot like, um, information and um, support to class to classroom teachers. So when we have teachers who are still going across three or four schools, this would be a really great way for them to communicate um, effectively so that, um, because, and that's some of the feedback we got from teachers. It's really hard to connect sometimes with ESOL teachers because they're in so many places. And so this would allow them to do that in a much more um, efficient and effective way. Thank you. You're welcome. And I lied, I had two more questions. Does this pricing also include professional development and product support for teachers? Yeah, that's, yes, that's in the 2.4 million. It's in, all of that's included. All of that's included, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Board members, do I have a motion to Recommend to the full board for approval items M1 through M15. So moved. Do I have a second? All in favor? Okay, that motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. One. Okay, second. Okay, all in favor? And we are adjourned.